Once lordly, once decrepit, and now secluded. Chatham has loomed over Fredericksburg for more than two centuries. Washington, Jefferson, and Lincoln visited here. Some of Virginia's most prosperous lived here. Soldiers by the hundreds suffered here. Generations of slaves toiled here. Chatham has always been a place of contrast, a place of beauty devastated by war, a place of prominence and prosperity sustained for more than a century by the labor of slaves, people who neither earned nor owned anything. William Fitzhugh and his wife, Anne Randolph Fitzhugh, first opened Chatham's door in 1771. Symmetrical and massive, Chatham looked down on the emerging town of Fredericksburg from Stafford Heights. The Fitzhughes lived in a world dominated by revolution and wealth. Though thoroughly English in his family origins, William Fitzhugh ardently supported independence. He mixed with some of the most famous men of his time, Patrick Henry, James Madison, George Washington. He served in the Virginia House of Burgesses, the State Senate, and in 1779, the Continental Congress in Philadelphia. Meanwhile, Chatham became famous for its hospitality. The house's prominence made it a social magnet. Visitors sometimes came in numbers that nearly overwhelmed the Fitzhugh's ability to feed them all. During one two-week period in the 1790s, a swarm of guests consumed 21 calves, sheep, lambs and goats, three sturgeon from the river, and chickens untold. Behind Chatham's veneer of elegance lay a sprawling agricultural and industrial community. Slaves working hundreds of acres produced mostly corn, wheat, and oats. A matching kitchen and laundry flanked the big house, while farther afield were a dairy, smokehouse, mill, stable for 30 horses, a coach house for four carriages, barns, and quarters for slaves. As many as a hundred slaves lived and worked here. Field hands, blacksmiths, coopers, millers, groomsmen, housekeepers, children, mothers, and grandmothers. They had no legal names. The only record of their existence usually appears in the owner's will or inventory, and usually with a value next to their names. Negro man, Peter, $600. Negro girl, Millie, 150. Negro infant, Solomon, $50. Negro man, Bentley, a cripple, no value. Judy, Reuben. Their lives followed a relentless rhythm. Hannah. Sow, tend, harvest. Samson. Heat, hammer, nail. Charlotte. Cook, serve, clean. Alec. Feed, groom, harness. Ireland. Day after day. Winnie. Year after year. Infant Susan. Lifetime after lifetime. William and Anne Fitzhugh moved from Chatham in 1797, but the rhythm of life on the plantation continued, only occasionally disrupted. In 1804, a handful of Chatham slaves rebelled when their traditional Christmas holiday was cut short. They whipped their overseer and killed a local resident. Each of the rebellious slaves was either killed or sold south. In 1823, the owners of Chatham built the first bridge across the Rappahannock into Fredericksburg, a bridge whose modern successor is still known as the Chatham Bridge. And in late 1857, a new family moved into Chatham, James Horace Lacey, his wife Betty Churchill Jones Lacey, and their children. They would own Chatham during its most difficult years. In 
In 1861, few Virginians supported war more enthusiastically than J. Horace Lacey. Lacey owned dozens of slaves, and he firmly rejected the right of the federal government to limit the power of the states. Once war began, Horace Lacey joined the Confederate Army, and his wife Betty tried to supervise Chatham without him. But she soon decided the job was too much, and when the Union Army approached, she and her children fled the area. That left Chatham to the fates of war. Widely known as the home of one of Fredericksburg's most famous secessionists, and perched as it was on a ridge dominating Fredericksburg, Chatham attracted constant attention from Union armies as they overswept the area in 1862, 1863, and 1864. Union generals repeatedly used the house as headquarters. On May 23, 1862, President Abraham Lincoln met with several generals at Chatham. During the December 1862 battle, Union artillery lined the heights adjacent to Chatham. Generals gathered on the grounds and on the veranda to watch the fighting rage on the plains west of Fredericksburg. They witnessed Union disaster. Evidence of that disaster soon came streaming up Chatham's driveway in the form of wounded, hundreds of them. December 18th, 1862. The room in which I write is used as an operating room. And for six days, the tables have been occupied from morning until late at night. The house is full. Men lie on the floors as close as they can be stowed. A little straw here and there is the best we can do for them. Dr. Franklin Dyer, Union Surgeon. Clara Barton and Dr. Mary Walker came to Chatham to help care for the wounded. The writer, Walt Whitman, came too. Chatham seems to have received only the worst cases. Outdoors, at the foot of a tree, within 10 yards of the front of the house, I notice a heap of amputated feet, legs, arms, hands, about a load for a one-horse cart. Several dead bodies lie near, each covered with its brown woolen blanket. The house is quite crowded, everything impromptu, no system, but I have no doubt the best that can be done. All the wounds pretty bad, some frightful. The men in their old clothes, unclean and bloody. I went through the rooms, downstairs and up. Some of the men were dying. Walt Whitman. Weeks later, when silence once again descended on Chatham, a war correspondent visited the place. Every wall and floor is saturated with blood. The old clock has stopped. The child's rocking horse is rotting away on a disused balcony. The costly exotics in the gardens are destroyed. All that was elegant is wretched. All that was noble is shabby. All that once told of civilized elegance now speaks of ruthless barbarism. For the rest of the war, Chatham lay abandoned, save for occasional use by Union surgeons or visits from chili pickets. Its once elegant rooms even served as stables for Union horses. When Horace and Betty Lacey returned to Chatham at war's end, they found the place gutted. Windows gone, graffiti on the walls, blood on the floors, more than 130 Union graves in the yard. Chatham could be physically repaired, but one change would never be undone. Freedom for Lacey's slaves. At least two of them would serve as soldiers in the Union Army. The rest scattered to new homes, new lives, an uncertain journey into freedom. The end of slavery meant financial ruin for J. Horace Lacey. His personal fortune plummeted from $180,000 in 1860 
to just $2,000 after the war, most of that loss due to the exodus of slaves. Unable to fund repairs needed to restore Chatham to its former splendor, the Laceys sold their home in 1872. For the next 40 years, it would undergo a change common to many southern plantations after the war, from working farm to elegant retreat. When Helen DeVore and her husband, Daniel, acquired Chatham in 1921, they determined to rid the place of all hints of wartime woe. They tore off the pre-war porticos and put in more elegant entries. They changed the front of the house from the riverside to the land side and lined the new entrance with elaborate colonial revival gardens. Where once stood hospital tents and headboards for Union graves, now stand decorative walls and trellises, statuary and gazebos, pathways, and even a musical staircase. Industrialist John Lee Pratt purchased Chatham from the Devores in 1931, at the height of the Great Depression. By then, the place had transformed in both form and function. The big house no longer stood as the capstone to a larger agricultural and industrial operation. Instead, Chatham consisted of just 30 acres. The home had become a secluded refuge atop Stafford Heights, largely hidden from Fredericksburg. Pratt willed Chatham to the National Park Service in 1975. Today, Chatham vividly illustrates more than 230 years of Southern history. Pre-war prosperity, built on the foundation of slavery, wartime devastation, and post-war struggle, rebirth, and transformation. Few American places have such a story to tell. The scarred walls, the solitary graves tucked away, the ancient driveway trod by Lincoln, Washington, and Jefferson, the floors once covered by playing children and struggling wounded. The rooms once the scene of elegant dinners, the fields once worked by generations of slaves. They echo to us still with stories of hardship, prosperity, sadness, elegance, and courage. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.